Awesome. Welcome, everyone. Welcome to our fifth iteration of the Mariah Mitchell Association Winter Science Speaker Series. My name is Jack Dubinsky. I'm the director of the Mariah Mitchell Aquarium. And tonight I am so excited to introduce Isabella Gaw. Izzy was a fabulous volunteer at the Mariah Mitchell Aquarium in 2017. And then in 2018 and 2019, uh, she helped me manage the aquarium and we had an absolute blast together. And since then, she's gone off to the University of Hawaii at Manoa and she's now a graduate student studying the effects of marine plastics on fishes. So without further ado, uh, welcome Isabella. We're so excited to have you tonight. Hi Jack, thank you for having me. Let me just uh, screen share. and make this really small. All right, well, thank you, Jack and Ryan Mitchell for having me. I'm really excited to talk about microplastics today. So yeah, I'm Izzy. I am a master's student at the University of Hawaii at Manoa where I work in a fish lab. And uh, the lab primarily focuses on reproductive biology, which is really fun. And today I'm gonna be talking about the debris diet how microplastics are infiltrating the marine food chain. So first, I just wanna give a quick shout out to the Mariah Mitchell Association. This was actually my first experience um, and opportunity in the world of marine science in general. And I, I was so lucky. This has opened so many doors for me. I got to be a part of so many amazing experiences. As Jack said, I, I volunteered one year. The next year I came back as an intern and the year after I got to come back as aquarium manager. So such a wonderful progression. And during my time at Murray Mitchell, I got to be part of some long-term monitoring research. I got to be part of invasive species monitoring research. I got to learn how to talk to people about science. And for any scientists out there, you know how important that is. And I also got to learn how to aquarist, which I've brought with me to my master's degree. So I'm, I'm really happy uh, that I got to learn how to do that at MMA. And, um, and I also got to do a pilot study at the end, which was fantastic. I, we, we went to all these beaches across, across Nantucket and we collected pieces of plastic that had animals encrusted on them. And we tried to identify if the majority of these encrusting animals were invasive or native. So that was incredibly fun and interesting. Unfortunately, I have no data to report quite yet. We're still trying to identify all the various species. But if anybody has any specific questions about that after, I'm more than happy to answer them. Cool, so just a quick overview of what I'm gonna be talking about today. So first I'm gonna do a marine debris crash course and talk about what is marine debris in general. And then I'm gonna dive a little bit deeper into microplastics. What are microplastics and where can we find them? And then I'm gonna talk about what we know about microplastics and what we know happens to animals that ingest them. And then I'm gonna talk about my master's research a little bit and then wrap it all up with how you can help. So marine debris, there are lots of different flavors. There's in the ocean and uh, from what we produce, there's lots of different uh, type, there's lots of different debris that can end up and that has been found in the ocean. And these are the main types identified by NOAA. So there's plastics, glass, metal, paper products, cloth, rubber, and wood. And all of these have varying degrees of destruction, destructiveness in the ocean. For example, wood, is actually a colonizing surface from which lots of animals um, uh, colonize and actually utilize wood as a primary ecosystem. So that's, that's actually really cool. <laughs> so wood is not so harmful in the ocean, but on the other hand, plastics are, and this is what I'm gonna be talking about today. So how much plastic is actually in the ocean? And I unfortunately have to preface this with, we don't know. We don't know how much plastic is in the ocean. We've, we've been making plastic far longer than we've been counting how much ends up there. 
but we have started to estimate how much plastic we put into the ocean for certain years. So in 2010, there was an estimated 4.8 to 12.7 million metric tons of plastic that was inputted into the ocean internationally and that year alone. And these input estimates are actually slated to increase by an order of magnitude by 2025, which is pretty incredible. That's a lot of plastic. And I don't know about you guys, but I'm a very visual person. So 4.8 to 12.7 million metric tons is, I know that's a lot, but it's hard for me to imagine how much that actually is. So instead, if you think about an elephant, one small male African elephant can weigh approximately seven tons. So about 685,000 of these elephants is what 4.8 million metric tons of plastic weight looks like. So that's how many elephants have to be in the ocean to make up that mass. And that's on the lower end. So I was trying to explain this, uh, this association to Jack, and he just could not get his head wrapped around this elephant example. So I also have for all those New Yorkers out there, the Empire State Building, 4.8 million metric tons of plastic is also about equivalent to 88 Empire State Buildings worth of plastic. That's huge. And this is, again, on the lower end. And then by 2020, plastics are even estimated, or 20, sorry, 2050, plastics are estimated to outweigh fish. So that's, that's pretty significant. By 2025, there's supposed to be about one ton of plastic for every three tons of fish. And then by 2050, plastic will end up outweighing fish, which is pretty scary. So how does all of this plastic actually get into the ocean? Well, first, clothing and textile factories and even our washing machines um, are pathways to the ocean. A lot of washing machines have drains that um, go to wastewater treatment plants and then go to the ocean. So lots of microfibers can end up in the ocean this way as well as litter and storm drains. So I'm from Los Angeles and there's a lot of, lots of litter on the streets. And every time it rains, all of that trash throughout all of our streets goes down the storm drains straight, storm drains straight into the ocean. So that's really bad. There's a lot um, of government efforts actually to block this pathway. However, um, as you can see, this is a pretty wide, mesh. So there are bit pieces of plastic, especially smaller plastics that can get through, as well as this certainly does not trap microplastics. And then there's also windblown and municipal waste. So all of our trash, <laughs> for the most part, goes into landfills. And every time there's a storm, a windstorm, a rainstorm, anything that can stir up the air, it likely is stirring up all that trash as well, and is usually stirring up all the trash and can very often move it either directly into the ocean or onto streets where when it rains, it'll go to the ocean via storm drains. And this is actually a photo of an example of a particular landfill caught in the act with a windstorm picking up all the trash heading who knows where. There's also industrial waste. So there's a lot of factories that have wastewater outputs that unfortunately go right into the ocean and sometimes the wastewater will have plastic particles in it. So overall, clearly there are way too many ways for plastic to get into the ocean. And the best way to manage this is to create better waste management, which is of course easier said than done. If anyone out there is interested in this as a field, this is incredibly important and super necessary at this point in time. Also, I'm happy to talk about this more later. It's super interesting. So why are plastics harmful to marine life? Well, first, many animals actually can't distinguish between a food item and a plastic, a piece of plastic. So for example, this study right here with the bird, um, this is a study that looked at why birds were eating so much plastic. And they found that these pieces of plastic often smell like food items. So these birds will be investigating, looking for a piece of food, and then they smell something that smells like food, so they eat it. But unfortunately, it's a piece of plastic, and they don't know better. It smells like food. So they eat it, 
And the issue with that is that very often it will create a feeling of fullness, but without all of those really important nutrients. So the bird will walk around or the animal will walk around and feel like it's full because it feels full. So it's not gonna eat anything, anything more, which will eventually lead to starvation because it's not getting the nutrients it needs to survive. And once that plastic is actually in the gut of the animal, it can also cause tissue damages as well as gut blockages, which unfortunately can also lead to death. And I'm sure you guys are familiar with entanglement. This is a really big problem with a lot of our marine mammals and uh, marine reptiles and other things that need to, uh, other animals that need to come up in the surface uh, in order to get oxygen. So if you see over here, we can look at the sea turtle that's wrapped in all of this fishing line and thank, uh, this sea turtle was actually saved and cut free by all these very, very helpful divers. So that's good. But very often there's divers not, there's divers not in the ocean ready to help. So this is a big problem and can lead to drowning for any animals that get caught and they unfortunately need to surface to get their air. Also, plastics can travel the world's oceans on ocean currents. And this can transport species from one place to another where they're foreign and potentially invasive, which can cause a crazy amount of biological and ecological harm. So there's lots of different types of plastics. I'm gonna say polymer quite um, a lot and polymer just refers to the chemical composition of the plastic. So basically what that plastic is made up of chemically. There's also lots of different size classes of plastic. So there's macroplastic, which is like your of course, don't do this, <laughs> but this is like your water bottle that you would throw into the ocean. That water bottle is a macroplastic. There's also microplastic, which is anything less than five millimeters. And then there's nanoplastic, which is anything less than 100 nanometers. So that's even smaller. There's also different shapes of plastic. There are microflakes, which are all these little fragments here and all these different shapes. Then there are microbeads, which are spheres. And then there's microfibers, which are fibrous. And microflakes generally come from things like that water bottle I was talking about. If you throw that into the ocean and it becomes microflakes, um, generally it comes from something else uh, degrading over time. Microbeads generally are produced and uh, keep that spherical shape. And then microfibers generally come from clothing. So when you wash your clothes, and microfibers make their way to the ocean. There's also a difference between primary and secondary plastic. So primary plastic is, again, this water bottle. Let's say you throw it in the ocean. Don't, but let's say you do. That would be a primary plastic because that water bottle is in the ocean. A secondary plastic is when that water bottle breaks down into microplastics. That would be a secondary plastic. So where are all of these microplastics? Well, about 90% of them are thought to be in the sediment, about 8% are thought to be in the water column, and about 0.2% are thought to be in the surface waters. And just a big caveat to these estimations is that they are estimations. <laughs> um, the majority of these studies uh, were use nets to collect the microplastics that were bigger than 300 microns. So that just means that it's not collecting a majority of the microplastics and the smaller nanoplastics. So that's important to keep in mind when looking at these numbers. However, they are a great estimation for what we're likely seeing in the water. And then a sad fact is that we have found microplastics in every single biome on earth, including the Arctic and the deep sea. So how do these macroplastics turn into microplastics? Well, there's five main ways. And the first is that sunlight actually can break down macroplastic into microplastic. Um, this is thought to be probably the most likely way we're getting microplastics, as well as it's the quickest way. And by quickest, I'm talking about hundreds of years. <laughs> Unfortunately, many pieces of plastic have UV stabilizers in them, and that actually increases the uh, time it takes to break down into smaller and smaller pieces. The second thing is that seawater actually can break down plastics. It can create, um, seawater can create a, a chemical change in the uh, surface of the plastic and allow it to break down. 
which this is thought to be probably one of the slowest processes. And then the third is that wave sand and other marine abiotic forces can break down micro or plastics into microplastics. So let's say you have that trusty water bottle again and you throw it in the ocean and a wave comes and breaks it into tons of little pieces. That's what that's referring to. That's mechanical degradation. And number four is that heat can actually break down plastics as well. This is thought to be the least likely way that macroplastic is turning into microplastics. But as the ocean warms up, uh, you know, due to climate change, this is thought to be potentially more and more important, or it will become more important. And number five is that marine microorganisms can also break down plastics, which I think is particularly interesting. So let's say you have this water bottle again, and you throw it in the ocean. The second that that water bottle hits the ocean, microorganisms will start to colonize it. Some of them will die. And when they die, that death actually leads to the changing of the chemical composition of the plastic and makes it more vulnerable to either sunlight breaking it down, seawater breaking it down, or other marine abiotic forces like waves. So I'm sure you guys have seen something like this before. This is an infographic showing different types of uh, marine debris, everything from glass bottles to paper towels to plastic and how long it takes from them to get from macroplastic to microplastic. So in our case of our trusty plastic water bottle, um, we're looking at about 450 years, which is a long time. So why are all these macroplastics a problem, right? We can't see them. Well, unfortunately, they are capable of absorbing persistent organic pollutants. And what I mean by this is that plastics are actually pretty porous and sponge-like. They can absorb pollutants and toxins. And so um, that, <laughs> that in and of itself can lead to a lot of problems, especially it can cause numerous physiological and neurological problems if you just directly ingest a microplastic that has absorbed a toxin. There's also something called biomagnification that can happen. And that refers to a um, how a toxin can actually accumulate as you go up a food, a food chain and um, animals will become progressively more and more toxic. So for example, let's take a look at this image. See all these little plastic pieces. Let's say that each of these have absorbed um, particularly nasty persistent organic pollutant or a toxin like DDT. And let's say that this, all these plankton eat about 10 plastics each. It's a lot of uh, plastics. So, and then let's say the school of mackerel comes around and one mackerel eats, it's gonna eat more than one plankton, he's probably hungry, eats about a hundred plankton. That one mackerel is eating about a hundred plankton that have 10 microplastics each that have absorbed a toxin. So one of those plankton is not as toxic as that one mackerel. And this gets even worse when a seal comes in like this seal. And of course, seal's not gonna eat one mackerel. Seal's gonna get as many mackerel as it can eat. Let's say it eats 100 mackerel. That's 100 mackerel that had 100 plankton that had 10 microplastics with that toxin each. So that's essentially biomagnification which clearly is problematic as we go up the food chain. We've also seen that microplastics are unfortunately readily ingested by both filter feeders and fish. And we also are learning more and more that the smaller microplastics get, potentially the more opportunity they have to make their way into organs, which can have numerous unknown health effects. We also don't know the extent to which microplastics infiltrate food webs and affect individual animals. And lastly, we don't know how many microplastics are in the ocean, which I think poses um, definitely a problem. So how do microplastics impact humans? Where do we come in? So we're part of that food chain too, right? If you like eating fish, unfortunately, you're probably eating plastics too. Um, in regards to ingesting toxins and biomagnification, currently the risk is debatable. There's still research going on to see how much toxin we're eating in this area. So don't, don't get too scared yet. Wait for the science to come out. <laughs> but currently we're not quite sure. 
We're also not sure about the specific health effects of just eating plastics in general or ingesting plastics in general. But we do know that on average, people ingest about five grams of plastic a week. If you take a look at this spoon, this is about five grams. So it's a lot. So in the field, what do we know about microplastic ingestion so far? And when I say in the field, I'm talking about scientists went out into the ocean, collected a ton of flora and fauna, and they opened it all up to see where and how much microplastics were accumulating in these animals. So I have, uh, there's a lot more studies than this, but I picked out three that really show that microplastics are in every part of the food chain, which is unfortunate. So first, there have been studies that have found that seagrasses can even accumulate microplastics. And I think that this is particularly troubling because seagrasses often are the skeleton, the support system of many ecosystems, including Nantucket. And in another study in the deep sea, they found that every single filter feeder they sampled had a variety of plastic particles in and on them, which is very concerning, especially in the deep sea. And in 2015, off the Portuguese coast, Microplastics were found in approximately 20% of the 263 fish samples of 26 species. So that's a lot. 20% is a lot. It's a lot of, it's a lot of microplastics. And this is, as I was saying before, unfortunately, just a snapshot of the myriad of field collections that have found microplastics and their sampling. So we know that this is occurring across food webs everywhere. But what are the biological implications of ingesting microplastics? Well, I'm going to break up these few slides between invertebrates and vertebrates because after ingestion, likely the pathway along our, or in our bodies is quite different. So first I'm going to start with invertebrates. But in the lab, what do we know about microplastic ingestion so far? So all these studies basically um, introduced microplastics into the water in these animals in some way. And they looked and saw what organs the microplastics accumulated in. And then they also looked to see potentially what, uh, what symptoms this ingestion caused. So in invertebrates, microplastics were found in the stomach of blue crabs, green crabs, and oysters. They were found in the ovaries of a green crab, the hemolymph of a blue mussel. And hemolymph is, um, not equivalent, but it's almost like our blood. And it was found in the gills of blue mussels and green crabs, also in the hepatopancreas of green crabs. And this is almost equivalent, but not quite to our pancreas. So <clears throat> when these microplastics were found in the stomach, they found in oysters a decreased sperm velocity and oocyte number. And oocyte just refers to an imm immature egg cell. And also, they found that when microplastics were found in the stomach, they saw feeding modifications in these animals, which is particularly dangerous, especially if it means that this animal, if these animals are eating less, which of course can have other health effects. And they also saw tissue inflammation, which usually refers or usually means that something deeper is going on biologically, some other issue, and is. Uh, creating this tissue inflammation. These studies uh, didn't address that specifically, but I'm sure that that's going to, or that's gonna be resolved in the future as these studies are coming out every year. When microplastics were found in the hemolymph, they were found to persist over 48 days, which I think is particularly scary, especially for seafood lovers. And when microplastics were found in the gills, they also found tissue inflammation. So, I just wanna show you guys this super cool, um, this is called a histological slide. It's a really, really, really thin slice of the stomach of a blue muscle that they gave microplastics to. And these red arrows show where the microplastics are. And then this is under a certain light that helps show these, these are fluorescent microplastics. So the blue is the microplastic. And you can see how it's really accumulated in the gut. So in the lab, 
what do we know about microplastics so far? <laughs> Again, but this time we're going to be talking about vertebrates. So this is a little closer to home. So when vertebrates, these are freshwater fish, deeper fish, when they were exposed to microplastics, they were found in the liver, the gut, and the gills. And these are all vital organs, so that's pretty scary. And I also just want to quickly point out that there's considerably less studies I have cited on this page. And of course, I haven't, I haven't shown you guys all of them, but I've shown you a few. But this, but this is still um, this is still the same as we're seeing in the literature. There's a lot less studies in about in regarding vertebrates ingesting microplastics than there are invertebrates. So this is this is a new field. <clears throat> but when microplastics were found in the liver, we saw inflammation as well as oxidative stress. When microplastics were found in the gut, we saw inflammation, oxidative stress, bowel wall thinning, villus damage, and epithelial damage. And all of that means it's just a host of tissue damage, which is quite unfortunate. And then when microplastics were found in the gut, they saw gut blockages, which the author suggested leaded to that fullness bleeding feeling, as well as a depleted energy budget, which has numerous biological consequences. So again, these are histological slides showing where these microplastics ended up in these fish. So this one is the gill, and these little green dots are the microplastic particles. And then this is the liver. You can see a little microplastic there. And this is the gut, and you can see the microplastics accumulating on the edges. And I just want to quickly note that um, when these microplastics were found in the liver, a lot of these studies use differ, differing uh, sizes of microplastics to see how far they can get in the body. And um, the only size that was found to accumulate in the liver was anything less than five microns, so nothing above. So how the heck does a microplastic, after you eat it, get to your liver? And this is something that hasn't yet been described for marine vertebrates. So this is what my uh, PI, my advisor and I are working on together for my project, which is very exciting. So this is essentially what we think. Um, we think it's likely through the lymphatic system, which if you haven't heard of it before, it's part of the circulatory system and it forms a unidirectional pathway from the extracellular space to the venous system. And when I say venous system, I mean our cardiovascular blood system. So based off previous studies with rats, we have figured out that we think that, let's say you ingest a microplastic or a fish ingests a microplastic, gets, makes its way to your gut, to the small intestine, and then it's taken up by the gut-associated lymphoid tissue. If you guys remember, I showed you that slide where all the microplastics were accumulating on the gut there. So that would give um, the opportunity for this tissue to take up the microplastics. And then through, and then it would be in the lymph lymphatic system and it would travel basically up the body to the heart where this is what it's supposed to do. It dumps into the heart and then with the lymph and the microplastic and then makes its way to the cardiovascular system. And through the cardiovascular system, it will have the opportunity to osmotically interact with organs via capillaries. This is what we think. But we don't know. So <laughs> clearly there's a lot, there are a lot of unknowns in this field. Uh, we don't know a lot, which for anyone out there listening interested in this field, or microplastics and biology in general. This, there's so many opportunities here for master's projects and PhD projects or research projects in general. So um, if you have any, any ideas, I, I would love to talk about it after. But just some things we don't know that I'm particularly interested in and that I'm using for my project is that what are the imp impacts associated with ingestion? What happens? What happens to the animal after you ingest a microplastic? And especially, what about virgin microplastics in vertebrates? And when I say virgin microplastics, I'm talking about plastics that have not taken in a toxin. And I think that's particularly interesting 
to me, it makes sense that if you, if you <laughs> feed something toxic to a fish, of course, something bad's going to happen to it, right? So what about just plastics? What did they do to vertebrates? No one has looked at reproduction and reproductive organs yet with ingesting microplastics. So we're curious what, what happens. Um, is, this, is this part of the equation? And we also don't know the extent of the trophic transfer. How far can a microplastic make its way up a food chain? And also, what about the environmentally relevant concentrations of microplastics, if we can even estimate them? So a lot of these other studies um, put a fish in a Pyrex and then they pour 1 million microplastics in it, right? So <clears throat> that's super interesting. We learn a lot about what microplastics do, but it would be also really interesting to figure out what environmentally relevant concentrations look like and what that does. So this is essentially my master's. We're addressing this knowledge gap. We're trying to learn from prior research and fill it in with new research. So we know from prior research that a depleted energy budget and decreased nutritional intake can negatively affect both realized fecundity and gamete quality. We also know that oxidative stress has been proven to cause subfertility in both males and females due to impaired sperm quality and oocyte maturation. And in oysters, we have seen that microplastics ingested cause decreased oocyte numbers as well as sperm motility. So could this apply to marine fishes? And potentially, will marine fishes have altered reproduction from microplastic ingestion? So this is what we want to figure out. So in order to do this, um, my plan is to create an artificial trophic transfer. So essentially, we're going to feed microplastics to brine shrimp and then feed these brine shrimp full of microplastics to these wild caught gobies. And this trophic transfer, or artificial trophic transfer, is an attempt to attain environmentally relevant concentrations of microplastics, as well as create a more natural microplastic exposure. So another important piece of this puzzle is that we really want to just look at what microplastics do to the body of an animal. We don't want these, um, these fish to starve because they feel full. So what we're going to do is we're going to soak the microplastics essentially in a vitamin. It's like a fishy, fishy, fatty, fishy oil vitamin called Celcon. If you've worked at the MMA Aquarium, I know you've seen it and used it likely to ensure that starvation and nutrient deficiency is not a factor. We're going to make these microplastics really nutritious. So this is my study species. This is Aviota epiphanes. And Aviota epiphanes is really small, about 2.5 centimeters in total length. It is a species of goby found in Hawaii. It's benthic dwelling, which means it lives on the bottom. It's hermaphroditic, which means it can have both male and female uh, sexual organs, but not at the same time. And they're scavengers. So that means it eats dead and decaying organic matter as well as live small crustaceans, copepods, and invertebrates. And all those animals I just mentioned are unfortunately likely culprits to ingesting microplastics, as well as have been seen to readily ingest microplastics in the lab. So especially this animal, benthic detritivores, and detritivore means uh, things that eat dead things, <laughs> are particularly vulnerable because they ingest dead and decaying organic material Unfortunately, a lot of the time without um, knowing <laughs> what killed the dead and decaying uh, matter that they were eating. So very likely they could be eating a small crustacean that died from eating too much plastic, right? So they could be eating that, so that's dangerous. And they were exposed to microplastics that accumulated in the sediment, because they're benthic. And they're exposed to floating microplastics ingested in the surface waters because they're eating things that eat the plankton in the surface waters. So they're exposed both from the top and the bottom. So <clears throat> Aviota epiphanies is, or was found in one study to be the most abundant larval and post-metamorphic species and one of the baits here in Oahu. 
And this is really important for a few reasons. One, it's an abundant food source for predators. And another is that they create a lot of babies and, um, or eggs. And when these eggs die, they help fuel the coral reef nitrogen cycle, as well as through their detritivorous diet, they help fuel that uh, nitrogen cycle. So these guys are pretty important um, to the, they're pretty important to the coral reef ecosystem here. So here are, here are some problems. These guys are really important and they're pretty vulnerable. So it would be a really good idea to figure out if they're affected by the increasing amount of microplastic in our oceans, especially because their diet, lifestyle, a diet and lifestyle make them particularly vulnerable. So my study polymer is polystyrene. And this is just the plastic that I'm using for my study to feed to the vine shrimp and then the gobies. So this, uh, this plastic is interesting because it floats instead of sinks which allows for easy ingestion for these brine shrimp because they like coming to the surface when they're adults. It's one of the most abundant plastics found in our ocean. And I'm sure you guys are familiar with it. If you've heard of styrofoam before, that is a type of polystyrene. It's also a very common polymer for microplastic studies, which is nice to say consistent and standardized with the current literature so we can compare and contrast our findings with other studies findings. So my trials. So this is how we're going to be keeping our fish. So it'll be separated by an opaque divider so they can't see each other or even send chemical cues to each other, which is very common in the marine world. And water comes in this way and water flows out over here on each side. And there's five micron mesh on either side so that uh, microplastics don't make their way back into the ocean through our drains. So at this point, I was really hoping to show you guys some fish data. Um, unfortunately, due to the pandemic, the pandemic, we're about a year behind schedule. But I do have some fun brine shrimp pilot data. So we did a little, a very mini experiment to see if um, what type of container allowed for the best ingestion as well as retention of microplastics for these brine shrimp. So we, um, I'm not reporting any statistics here because there wasn't, um, this is just a pilot study to see, to have some casual findings. But casually, we found that the brine shrimp ingested and retained the most microplastics at six hours. So what we did is we fed these uh, brine shrimp in these little containers filled it up with seawater and then we put in microplastics and then we sampled at different hours. So we sampled at one hour, two hour, three hour, four hour, five hour, six hour, 24 and 48. And when we sampled all these, we um, put them in a little, a little uh, slide and then we looked to see how many microplastics six brine shrimp had ingested over time, six different brine shrimp had ingested over time. So about six, um, about six hours was the time where they were ingesting the most and retaining the most. And then there's a pretty common drop off. And then on top of that, we found that potentially this might be the best container <laughs> to get the, uh, to have brine shrimp that eat the most and retain the most microplastics, which is interesting. So this is actually a photo of a brine shrimp gut with tons of microplastics in it. Um, this guy was fed, of course, uh, microbeads, and you can see all of them here. And we counted about over a hundred. So you can see that uh, here's proof that they readily eat microbeads without discretion. So in order to um, observe any differences in the reproductive organs in our gobies and assess the health of the reproductive organs, we're going to do something called histological analysis. And so that means that we're going to cut really, really, really thin slices of the gonadal region. So either the ovaries or the testes, and we're going to look to see uh, if the 
we're going to compare the experimental and the control group. So we're going to look at the experimental, which is the fish that ate the microplastics and compare it with the control, the fish that we didn't eat microplastics to and see if there's any differences in that region, which should be really interesting. Um, and we're also going to look at the liver and cut that open to see if any microplastics made their way there as well. So lastly, um, I, this is my plastics plea. <laughs> we are all plastics first responders. This is a new field. New findings are being published every year. We're finding out new things every year. If you're interested in this at all, either from any standpoint as from a biology, ecology, waste management, um, communication, what have you. This is, there's so much area for growth and opportunity here. So I, <laughs> I'm clearly biased, but I, um, there's lots of room for new people. So if this is something that interests me, I'd be happy to talk to you about how to get involved later. Just some other little things that you can do to help um, improve the health of our open oceans and keep them healthy is support companies that care about ecosystem health as well as sustainability. Supporting legislation for more and better recycling is key. Spreading awareness. Anyone that you can talk to about this <laughs> will help uh, if it prevents the next person from throwing a water bottle on the ground. That's huge. And reducing and reusing is particularly important. As much as you can avoid single-use plastics, that is huge. I know it's been hard during the pandemic. A lot of places, um, especially if you like takeout, they aren't offering, uh, or coffee shops, they're not offering uh, cups anymore, or uh, you're not allowed to bring your mugs anymore. You have to take have their takeaway, which is, is what it is. So... Avoid single-use plastics, of course, but um, be as safe as you can because it is this. We're we're in a pandemic, and if you have to, you have to. And lastly, pick up any trash you see because any trash that's on the street and a, a storm comes, it, uh, the storm can just sweep all of that plastic right into the ocean. And as said in Finding Nemo, all drains or most drains lead to the ocean. And thank you all for listening. Izzy, thank you so much for that amazing talk. We're so glad you could come and talk to us about your work. And um, thanks so much again. And uh, thank you all for uh, those of you who are attending in, um, live. And thank you all for um, everyone watching on YouTube as well. Um, this talk will be posted on YouTube in the coming days. And if you missed any of our previous talks, uh, feel free to check out our YouTube page as well. We have a special playlist for the Winter Science Speaker Series. And unfortunately, due to a technical error, we were not able to record the Q&A section uh, for this talk. But if you have any questions for uh, myself or for Izzy, feel free to email me at uh, jdubinsky at mariahmitchell.com. And I'm happy to make that connection. Thank you so much, everyone, again, and have a great rest of your night. <laughs> Bye.